UTC building at Southern University is named after him. He was an amazing mentor to younger soldiers coming through the military. And the military, remember back in the 50s and 60s, it was not easy. It's still not easy, and especially for a black man in the military yeah. commanding yeah. white soldiers from the South. It was not easy. So sometimes he took that pain out on his family. But we are stronger because of what we've gone through, because I believe all of us have come out on the other side and we understand what it means for a family. So when people look at veterans, I want them to remember those veterans have mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, wives, children. And even though they may not be with them now, they still exist and they want those men and women to get well and to come back home, to come back to their family. They deserve that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Consequence Ahead podcast. I, I've been speaking to this guest before we hit record, and I was explaining how excited I am about this this interview. The more research I've done into this this woman, the more excited I am. Uh, today, I have the opportunity to sit down with Detrice Martel Gator. Detrice, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Oh, I'm so happy to hear to be here, and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk and to share about things that are very, very close to my heart, for which I have deep passion. I'm going to start off. There's a lot I want to get into about your history, why what you're doing is is so important to you. But I want to start off with some statistics. You correct me if I'm wrong in anything I'm about to say. 37,000 homeless veterans in America. Yes. Approximately. Am I correct? In saying yes, that? you are. What's been done up until now? Because I, I, I heard you talk about something that there's a lot of times there's an obvious thing out there. And, and the most important question to ask is, What's been done leading to now, and what is the next solution? We already know what the problem is. 20-something years of war, everything that goes along with that, mental health issues, addiction issues, PTSD issues. What has been done to help the homeless Americans, veteran Americans, up until what you're doing now? Well... Actually, people have begun to work on this since we found out that the most of the homeless were Vietnam veterans at one time. And mm -hmm. right now we have three, gen three war generations of veterans out there. We still have aging Vietnam veterans that are out there homeless and still struggling with their behavioral health issues. And these are now senior citizen veterans and homeless people. We have Afghanistan. We have Iraq. Uh, we have folks from the Korean War. We have so many generations that are out there together that have different needs. One of the things that we started doing was trying to find housing for veterans who are on the street, trying to find services to help them. And I want to remind you that Volunteers of America has been helping veterans since the veterans of the Civil War. We're not wow. new to this space at all. A lot of the issues that were prominent when we were founded in 1896 were because of the PTSD and the injuries that veterans and their families were enduring as a result of having lived through and fought in a war. Now, another thing I want to make sure everyone's clear is that when we talk about veterans homelessness, everyone thinks about one person, generally one man. A lot of women veterans are homeless. A lot of veterans with children and families are homeless. We have started to do more than just find empty apartments or housing for veterans. We have started trying to find innovative ways to find housing faster. Because most people, most of your listeners aren't real clear that it can take five to seven years from concept to completion of housing units. By the time you go through the zoning, the supply chain issues, getting the labor, all those things from pencil to paper to draw the design till the day someone walks through the door can take five to seven years. Too long. That is too long to wait for new housing for veterans and their families. So we've done some pretty innovative things lately. One that I'm particularly proud of is in California, we took a former military base that had been decommissioned and turned it into housing for veterans and their families. It's called Blue Butterfly Village, and it's outside of Los Angeles. And uh, there are about 75 townhouses there. 
25 were designated for women veterans and their children. And many of those women veterans were being reunited with their children because their children had been taken away because they were sleeping in cars or they were struggling with abuse issues. And those are some of the kinds of innovative things we've been doing. Another one is Tiny House. Now, many of you know about tiny, tiny houses and have heard of them and think they're very cute, but we have people who are partnering with us to actually say, come build a tiny house in my backyard. I've got tons of space back there. This is such a wonderful thing for me and my family to partner with you on. And so we have something called Yard Homes. Yard Homes is an organization that we partner with to build tiny homes. And we're also partnering with foundations and corporations. For instance, the Home Depot Foundation, one of our most favorite partners. We partnered with them in December to cover the housing payments for more than 500 veterans, including including veterans who are at risk of homelessness. So we're paying the mortgage and the rent for 500 veterans for the month of December. Quite a Christmas present, wouldn't you say? Yeah, And another thing we're doing is working with mobile units, um, some trains from trains. We are fortifying these uh, train boxcars, putting windows in them, making them lovely and beautiful spaces for people. And then real quick, one more thing that we're doing, we have something called Cabin in the Woods. Some of the veterans come back from combat. They don't want to hear noise. They don't want to be around people. They want to own a place to go to sleep that's safe every night, but not in multifamily housing, not in a neighborhood. And they really want to live out in the woods. So we went out and met with veterans who were living in the woods. We met with them on park benches and said, where do you want to live? How can we do this? So we've uh, built little cabins, literally cabins in the woods for veterans. And I'm so proud of my colleagues and our partners that we work with who have come up with these innovative ideas to move it housing faster and safer and so that we can provide more housing for more people who've sacrificed for our country and deserve to have a safe place to go to sleep at night. Well, it's, it's funny because, you know, after you say that, it seems like a no brainer. We watch these shows on TV. We watch, you know, some of these like a free spirited person that, that's either living in a van or they want these tiny homes or they're, they're making homes out of, out of shipping containers. Why wouldn't we use these for, for veterans? I mean, the people that, that have served us, it's, you know, you're talking about a life of service. Why wouldn't we do this for them? This seems like a, a, a not, I mean, it's not a no cost, but a much uh, a smaller cost. And then time-wise putting these things together. You know, when I look at five major locations, five different markets, you're doing this across the country. And I, w- and I was looking at what Volunteers of America does. And one of the things I was most impressed by is uh, partnerships. Anyone who knows the nonprofit world knows that, man, it is like people, they put up these fences because money, when it comes down to getting donors, everyone gets a little territorial. And I get it. I get it. But what I've seen, what you guys have done is you've partnered with other nonprofits. You've partnered with, with other companies to make this thing come to a reality. What was that process like for you? How long did it take? And how open were both the cities and the other nonprofits to working with you? Well, in the nonprofit world, one thing that we know, you can't do it alone. You need to partner, you need to work in coalitions, and you need to collaborate. Now, that always becomes difficult when you are competing for funding. We don't like to use the word competitor because many of us are competitors for the same dollars from the same people. But one area where people have really stepped up is the funding community, the foundations, the corporate foundations, the private philanthropists. They are now funding in ways that encourage partnerships and people collaborating on projects together. Some of the things that we've had to work with are zoning, zoning issues. People, there's something called not in my backyard, NIMBY. People who who think that these are dangerous people, I don't want them near me. So we've had to work and do a lot of meetings with communities, with neighborhoods to explain who our future residents are. They are people that you are related to, that are in your church, that are in your neighborhood, that you went to high school with. 
these are not people you need to be afraid of. These are people you need to embrace in your community and be proud that you are making a place for our veterans to live safe lives. So that kind of work, the people to people work is the most intense and people know when you're authentic or not. So you have to take the time. You have to listen to people where they are and try to give them information and reassurance and tell them the truth so that we can get to a place where we can provide more housing for veterans. Yeah. Yeah. And and you really touched on the next question because if you said to anyone out there, hey, do you think we should provide more housing for homeless veterans? We understand that that it's not always just I don't have a, a place to live, that there's usually things that go along with that. And, and I think that's where that not in my backyard comes along. How have you gotten the trust from the local community um, where, where you, can, you can present this, hey, this is part of becoming a healthier person, get, getting back their independence, that this isn't, like you said, a dangerous person who, who quite possibly is, is, well, not quite possibly, is, is, is a, a very low point in their life. And this is part of rebuilding that. I mean, have you been completely rejected by some communities? I mean, what has that been like for you? Well, one, since we've been around for over 127 years, we really depend on our reputation. And we are meticulous about our reputation, keeping our words to people in the communities, keeping our words to our clients and potential clients. And we often bring people, men, women, and families who have been served and helped through these kinds of housing to meet with people in the community so that they can see these people are like my relatives, like my brother-in-law, like my church member, by the guy I went to high school with. They're not dangerous. These are people who are just looking for a safe place to live, who had some bad luck. And almost everybody has someone in their family who is struggling with alcohol, drug, depression, bipolar, all kinds of issues that we try to keep a secret. But it's not a secret. So many people deserve and are working towards recovery. And not only that, but there's also recovery from PTSD. I think you mentioned that. Everyone talks about post-traumatic syndrome, but this is very serious. And there's also something else that Volunteers of America works on, and that's something called moral injury. Moral injury is PTSD that is deeper. It cannot be solved with medication or just talk therapy. It involves a community of support and help. It involves people who have emotional distress, guilt, or shame that comes from participating or witnessing something that hurt other people. Oftentimes people are suffering from moral injury and not understanding why do they feel like I am not worthy, I am not deserving, I am a bad person. To brand yourself a bad person, can you imagine how badly that hurts? That hurts everything, not just you, your family, your friends, your parents, everybody hurts because you're hurting so badly. So we've been doing a lot of work on moral injury. And this is something that people, not only people in combat, but first responders, healthcare professionals, military veterans, all kinds of people are suffering from believing that they could have, should have done something more, done something differently, and that they hurt someone, not understanding that they're hurting themselves by living with this shame and guilt and distress. Well, I, I think that's, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head. The, the, if anyone takes more than three seconds to think about what our veterans, what our first responders uh, do on a daily basis, You'll, you'll start to realize that the what they're going through, whether that be PTSD, whether that be addiction, whether that be issues around any issues around mental health, that this is actually a normal response to having to deal with unnormal situations in their life. We are not designed to have to do these things. And when you do them in the service of your country, there should be an expectation that they there's something waiting for you, that there's help for you, whether that be in housing, whether that be through the VA, however that that looks. I would love to have an argument with somebody, or I should say a debate with somebody that that uh, doesn't agree with having this in their local community, um, because like you said, with a moral injury, this is a life sentence for many people. And you actually, this is something that, and I don't know if it, it comes to the level of moral injury, but 
you've had your own experiences with a family member who's who's had undiagnosed PTSD. I, am I, I correct in saying that? I'm glad that you brought that up because um, I am the daughter of an army colonel. My father left high school and went to World War II where he served in combat. He served in combat in Korea and he served in combat in Vietnam. Needless to say, my father was very damaged, very hurt, had behavioral health issues that were undiagnosed and you didn't want anyone to know because you didn't want to hurt your career. Mm. Living that life was very difficult. Sure. Inside of our home, there were a lot of secrets and a lot of shame because you don't want to hurt an officer's career. So you don't yeah. tell. And on the outside, it all looks good. It all looks good. You're the daughter of an army colonel, a black army colonel. Mm. So back in the seventies, that was equal to being a general. People would stop him on the street. They were so proud of him. And two things are possible at the same time. It is possible to be a very distressed, violent, difficult person at home and to be a military hero, a striver, a man of accomplishment, a man who was driven to help and to serve his country, his family. He was the youngest of 18 children. Same mother, same father from segregated, deep Southern Louisiana. So this man was a hero. He was my father but he also inflicted so much pain on himself and his children and his wife. Two things can be true at the same time. Has the work that you've been doing, has this almost been, I don't know if therapeutic is the right word, but, but you know, you get older and you don't, you re, when you're a kid, you don't realize that you don't understand that this person that I'm dealing with, that can be very difficult, but you know, we have these two different worlds. What, what has that experience been for you personally to deal a, with a the community? A couple of things, that's... a couple of things. My father demanded perfection. My mm. brother graduated from Harvard. I graduated from Syracuse Law School. My sister graduated from Carnegie Mellon. Each one of us is published. So he demanded perfection. Perfection doesn't exist. It's too hard. It's too hard on everybody. So I have been able to release myself from that elusive goal of perfection. Sure and allow myself to make mistakes, to forgive myself and to be human. Another thing is that this job has been cathartic for me. My passion of work with veterans, the passion of Volunteers of America, it was me in the right place at the right time. We published a book here called The Momentum of Hope. You can get it on Amazon, but um, <laughs> it is the stories of people that have lived through incidents in their lives that caused them moral injury and how they're coping with it and trying to overcome it. And one of the things that I realized in helping to edit that book and listening to other people's stories is that learning about this has helped me to forgive my father, to understand him, to understand his pain and how it manifested itself in our family. And it helped me to help my brother and sister to understand that as well and to be as proud of him as I can. The uh, ROTC building at Southern University is named after him. He was an amazing mentor to younger soldiers coming through the military. And the military, remember back in the 50s and 60s, it was not easy. It's still not easy, and especially for a black man in the military yeah. commanding yeah. white soldiers from the South. It was not easy. So sometimes he took that pain out on his family. But we are stronger because of what we've gone through, because I believe all of us have come out on the other side and we understand what it means for a family. So when people look at veterans, I want them to remember those veterans have mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, wives, children. And even though they may not be with them now, they still exist. And they want those men and women to get well and to come back home and come back to their family. They deserve that. And, you know, as far as being homeless, even as the child of a military officer, when we came back from Germany, I was born in Germany, by the way, but when we came back from his second tour of duty in Germany, we lived with our aunt and her husband in a small house in Washington, D.C. They had four people in their family and we had five people in our family. I never thought wow. of it until recently that there were nine of us living in a small brick house in Washington, D.C. because he was between assignments and we didn't have any place to live. Yeah. We lived with another yeah. aunt in, in Pittsburgh for three months. 
because again, he was between assignments and we didn't have a place to live. So having a place to live for these men and women who have served our country and come out hurt, let's help them get to the other side and to be healthy and to be contributing because that's what they want. We talk to these folks a lot. We meet with them and they can tell you about how the services and the trust that Volunteers of America gave them, looking them in the eye. When you see homeless people in the street, you don't look at them in the eye. You walk away as fast as you can. But to come in and to be looked at as a human being, to be supported, to be given the direction for a job, for housing, for behavioral health, so many people are medicating their own issues. Instead of going to a psychiatrist or to a therapist or to a psychologist, they're going to a bottle or a pill or promiscuity to find relief from the pain that they endure. Yeah, these things manifest themselves, especially with family members. And I, and I just want to go back one second. When you said I'm, a, I'm as proud as I can be is beautifully said. I, I mean that. Um, but when these things manifest themselves in whatever way that we're self-medicating, right? Like, and you mentioned we all have our poisons. It's a very personal thing uh, for, the, for the loved ones and the family members, and it's very hard to see through that surface level. Go, hey, they're doing this. Why don't they just stop? Why don't they just stop doing this thing without understanding that this is a way of trying to feel good because deep down they're in a world of shit so they're just trying to do the best that they can but the, the vicious cycle is that usually brings shame and now it, it compounds so what do we do we go back to trying to feel good and it's this vicious cycle and when you take the military you put people at a very young age in in, in these positions where they're responsible for whether it's it's a high value you know a monetary level or if you're in, in charge of other people and when you lose that foundation of being in service, of being looked at and respected as someone in uniform to, I would imagine, the person that won't, people don't look you in the eyes anymore. That's got to be such a demoralizing thing. And I think it's really beautiful to, to start to rebuild that foundation for this community, put them in a place, start that process, that traction, and then give them... An, everything they need is and really what I was getting to this this isn't a single hey we're going to put you in a place to live and your world is better that's it, it is uh, it's way more complicated than that as as you know but what you guys are doing even with, around the housing it truly is ins it's inspired me I mean I started thinking about like what can we do here in Delaware what because we know I know it's a problem we have got we've got a lot of military people here we've got a lot of military community that is suffering from whatever mental health issues. And, and a lot of times that manifests into addiction. Uh, so um, I, I'm, I'm kind of in awe of when I looked at Reno, Nevada, Durham, North Carolina, St. Paul, Minnesota, Los Angeles, Austin, all of the places that you guys are, are having an impact in this country. And um, no, I know this isn't just a, a, a hype thing for, for Detrees, but I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed with what you, you guys are doing. Go well, I'm just going to add you... that one of the things that I'm so proud of that we do here at Volunteers of America is that we just don't deal in bricks and mortar. We deal in mind, body, and soul. Because once you have, you can't get sober. You can't get another job. You can't reconnect with your family until you have a safe place to go to sleep at night. Yeah. A safe place. And not a bunk bed someplace but a place that so many people talk about how proud they are. I have my own refrigerator. I have my own stove. I have my own couch. And look how I put these plants here. And I tried to zhuzh it up, and make it look like home to me. People are so proud when they have their own space. And that space is the beginning of a new life. And that's why we are so proud at Volunteers of America. You've, I mentioned those five markets. Are there other ones in, you know, in the horizon that you, you, are, you can announce yet? Is there any other cities where you, this looks like it might uh, gain some traction as well? Well, all over. We're looking at uh, North Carolina, New York, 
Chicago. Oh, in Chicago, we have done so much. We have um, Hope Manor Place. We have three of them now, which are townhouse communities for veterans' families. So in a lot of urban areas and a lot of very rural areas, Hope, Maine, where we have Cabin in the Woods, South Florida, where we have Cabin in the Woods. We have work in the Northern Rockies, in Oregon, and we're all over the country and we are pen to paper making plans for even new communities for veterans and their families in new markets. We're in negotiation with quite a few now, some in Texas, a lot of military veterans in Texas. Sure, sure, yeah. Where did the idea come as far as the tiny homes go or, or the, the homes made made from, from the, the the train cars, like where, where did this, how did this even come to be? I think through coalitions, people working and talking together about how long it's going to take to build the houses yeah. and working with our partners in real estate and other housing organizations. There are a lot of homeless and housing organizations and trying to, again, collaborate and come up with one of the issues is urgency. We can talk about this problem forever, But then when the solution is to wait five to seven years, this is not the answer to an urgent issue. And through veterans themselves, veterans have come and talked to us. We don't just say, hey, veterans, this is what this is what you need. This is good for you. Right, right, right. We have veterans on staff. We have veterans in our community programs. We talk to homeless veterans through our programs, providing services on the streets. And we have listened to them about what they want and tiny homes, cabin in the woods, um, refurbishing other uh, hotels. We have taken other hotels. We have taken other uh, abandoned uh, apartment buildings. We even took a train station in Philadelphia and turned it into um, housing. So looking at buildings that were not were no longer used, and right now people are looking at office buildings. How can you turn office buildings that haven't been uh, used since the pandemic into potential housing. One of the big issues is where's the plumbing, enough plumbing in the office buildings. Sure. But we'll figure out a way around that as well. This call to service, not just the veterans, because you've been involved in lots of, of nonprofits and in leadership roles. Was that in something that was instilled from your father, this sense of, of, of service, or was this just something that kind of you were born with? It started with my family. My my family were what they used to call strivers. They were black people in the 50s who believed that if we worked hard enough, if we followed all the rules, if we made straight A's, that racism would go away and we would live better lives and we're helping our families and our race and moving past all the kinds of stereotypes about us because we have to work twice as hard. Good enough is not good enough. So I came from a striving family. My mother became a teacher. She finished her college degree while my father was in Korea. Sometimes as little kids, we would go to class with her. Her teachers would let her bring her three children and sit in the back of the class and I would take care of my baby brother while she was in class, as long as we were quiet. Sometimes we would have dinner and she would say I was not hungry. Now I know she didn't have enough food. Her husband was in Korea. She's paying college tuition and buying books so that she can get a college degree. That's striving. And what did she do? She taught kindergarten. She taught little kids in very urban areas that kids who didn't know their own names, kids who came from really desperate, destitute households. My father, as the youngest of 18, he was the most prosperous. He was the one with the college degree. He had a master's in international relations from GW. He was the one that they all called on. His brothers and sisters, their children, even their grandchildren. As the youngest, he was the patriarch of the family. We always had someone staying with us, someone even sleeping on the floor. We learned to help and that to whom much is given, much is expected. That whole idea of service came through both of my parents. Now, when you talk about habits, service is a habit. But it can be something where I think those of us in nonprofits and those of us in the health, helping and healing professions need to make sure that we 
remember the habit of self-care, self-love, well-being for yourself. I was talking to my staff the other day. I said, please help me, protect me from myself. I have got to stop saying yes to everything and everybody. Yeah. I'm exhausted. And you almost feel guilty when you are not exhausted. In order to be fresh and good enough to help other people, you have to take care of yourself. And that is a consequence of habit. The habit of service is a good habit, and it involves passion and compassion. One of the things about the staff and volunteers of America, most of them don't see this as a job. They see it as calling, and they go mm. way beyond anybody's nine to five. They come to work with compassion, and they provide services with passion. But we're also trying to get them and other people in your listening audience. This is a good habit, but it's only as good as you are. And you can be your best when you take care of yourself. That's a hard habit. That is a hard habit to get, to it's, keep, to find. Yeah, it, it will, in my mind, in my experience, to be the most effective at service, you got to have your stuff together. You have to be able to take care of yourself because that best version of you is there for not just you and your loved ones, but then you can, uh, you'll, you'll have more impact. But it's funny because it, it slips easy. You know, like we, we had a big speaking event and, you know, I host this, this, this podcast, Consequence of Habit. We've got a nonprofit. We teach things around mindfulness, meditation, nutrition, uh, working out. And I was so stressed leading into this event. I think the month the month leading up to it, I was I, I was probably emotionally eating, not sleeping, doing everything contrary to what I'm supposed to. And I know it, right? And I know it. So I, I understand what you're saying, that, that sometimes we have to be protected from ourselves because it, you can definitely, you can burn the candle on both ends. And especially when that mission, that that, that thing you're passionate about is, is in front of you. But you got to understand that there's there's limits to what we can do and, and, uh, man, burnout. I'm sure that, well, I already know in the nonprofit world, uh, there's a lot of burnout. So uh, well, the pandemic, the pandemic be- tested us all. It tested us all. And one of the things about coming out on the other side is understanding that we can help more people when we develop the habit of taking care of ourselves, getting enough sleep, getting nutrition, not drinking six cups of coffee a day, drinking a little water when you can, little things like that to take care of yourself. And uh, I'm trying to be more conscious of that and to be intentional about that. My staff still says I have FOMO, fear of missing out. And I (laughs) I, I have to learn that things can go on without me and that it's okay if I'm not there. And I'm right. working with incredible colleagues and staff people that can step up and start holding the mantle, pushing things forward. Yeah. Yeah. What, what do you think is, since we, you and I both are self-described people pleasers or, or were at one time, it's something we're, we're, we're working through. What's another one of your habits that's been, that's been one that's been either challenging for you or something you've overcome and and really felt a sense of pride from? Perfection, fear of making a mistake. When I loved speaking and talking to people, but the amount of preparation I put into even the smallest amount of speaking is because I've always said, if I fail, it won't be because I'm not prepared. I can possibly I'll fail or not be interesting or lose the audience, but it won't be because I didn't prepare. And I want to learn how to take some of that pressure off myself. At this point in life, I know what I'm talking about. I've lived it. I've done it for decades. I need to trust myself a little bit more that I don't have to stay up till 1 a.m. preparing for a 40-minute presentation tomorrow. Sure, (laughs) sure. Sure. Well, I, I, w- I will say this. You are the first person that has uh, that has, has actually requested information about me leading into an interview. I said, wait a minute, who's interviewing who here? Like what's, but I love it. Oh, I, I, I wanted it, to know who means... you are. And it's oh, very know, impressive who you are. You are very impressive. And JT, I hope you're listening to this as well, because you are so full of energy. You are everywhere. People are going to want to talk to you more and hear from you more. You have Oof. got to take care of yourself, JT. You keep up that I, habit. I appreciate it. I'm going to, I appreciate that very much. Um, Detrice, is, is there anything else you want to you make sure that we hit? Anything else you want to cover? 
Well, I think it's important for, when we talk about the consequence of habit, I think it's important to have other people in your life that make it possible for you to be motivated and to be effective in the things you're passionate or compassionate about, like your listeners are, your other guests are. And I have found that in life, there are three kinds of friends that I need. People always talk about having a kitchen cabinet. There are three kinds. One, I need someone when something is hurting me or I'm upset or I'm depressed or, or feel like I failed at something. I need someone I can go to who's going to pamper me and soothe me and make me a cake and say, come on, baby, let me talk. Come on over here and let me talk to you. You need this. Let, let's go out to dinner. Then there's the person who's going to call you accountable who's going to make you accountable, who's going to say, okay, Jatrice, that didn't go well. What's your game plan? How are you going to fix it? What are you going to do differently next time? What lesson did you learn? And then you need that third person who's just going to listen. You need to be heard. You need to be able to talk through what went wrong. Why are you blowing it this up into a much bigger issue than it is? Because everybody else is going to forget about it in two weeks except you. So you need someone who's going to listen. So I believe that everybody needs to have those three people in your life and they are not the same person. Who's no. gonna hug you no. and feed you and show you love? Who's gonna hold you accountable and make you get back up and, with a better plan? And who is going to listen to you? That's so hard nowadays to find someone that you can talk to confidentially, who will listen to you. Listening is almost a lost skill. So I think that those three people are a habit that everyone should form. Find those three people, get them in your life, and know who they are. Man, I couldn't agree more. I literally just had this conversation last weekend with somebody, and, and I, I could be generalizing this too much, but but I know for young men, there's a sense of accountability. Your, your, your feet being held to the fire and not just hearing somebody say, no, you're right and everyone else is wrong, right? We, we, we need that. We, and and our skin has to be thick enough to be able to handle that. And if you've got a friend that can do that in a, in a you know in a healthy way that motivates you, boy, you hold on to that person because we are, we need more of that. And and also the, the the compassionate person. I think the hardest person to find is the last one you mentioned. That's one that can just sit there and listen because a lot of times we work these things out. We just got to get. It's as you you know verbalize them. You start talking about things. You know, it happens to me all the time. I go as I'm telling somebody. I go wait a minute. I just figured it out. Never mind. We can stop talking now. I just, I had to, I had to say it because it's been rattling around in my head and I don't come up, come up with the answer, but once it comes out, we go, all right, kind of work through this. So yeah, that's, that's a, that's a tricky one to find there. That but last one point you made that's very important is I think it's especially important for men to find that women tend to be more verbal, tend to be more willing to be vulnerable and try to find that they all, they don't understand it's different people. One person cannot be all those things to you. But I think that men letting themselves understand, I need someone to pamper me today. I need someone to listen to me today. And I need someone to help me figure out a new strategy to get through this. You, you know, something I, I, I can't even believe I, did, I didn't mention this. Sharice, I got out of the Air Force in, in 2000, right? And I'm, I've got ADHD and I struggle. I barely got through high school. I mean, I truly struggled. And I go into the military and I excel. And, and for whatever reason, it was the first time in my life, I said, man, I got this thing licked. Like I can, I can do all these amazing things. I'm getting these awards. I'm getting, I'm getting promoted before I should be. This is fantastic. And that was structure and accountability. And then I got out. And I, when I got out, when I say that my, my world crumbled and I was not very far off from, from needing a place to stay myself. I was crashing on friends' couches and, and, and things like that. My point is that that, is a, that wasn't a huge block of time from the time I got out till I kind of reached that rock bottom. And that's because I didn't have the structure, I didn't have accountability, and I was suffering. At the time, I, I, was, I was in active addiction and alcohol. And, and as we're sitting there, I, I'm, I'm preparing for this interview and I'm thinking about questions to ask and it never even dawned on me. Like, wait a minute. I was, I was, I was six months away from the exact same thing. You know, so it's, it's an interesting thing. And, and it was a, really when we were talking about accountability is what, and, and for me, the accountability was just structure. It was just, I needed that structure. And I think that's why 
a lot of people that, that may even have issues, it's that structure that keeps them grounded. It keeps them in place and it keeps them doing, you know, I, I've had, uh, do you know General Greg Martin? No. Uh, Major General Greg Martin, he, he was an early guest. He was the president of the, I'm going to mess this up, it, it, it's, it's the largest military college there in D.C., and, and he suffered from bipolar, and he didn't realize it until, until he, he lost his job. And he was a major general at the time. It was, it was the military that kept him, uh, kind of kept a lot of things together for a while uh, because it was, you know, you have, you have expectations. You have to do things. You have to get up. You have to. There are some great habits, but not all of them are fantastic. But yeah, so, so that was my point is, is that this actually, as I'm in this conversation, I'm realizing that this actually hits probably way closer and maybe that was a subconscious thing for me kind of push this out and, uh, and the military uh, works for a lot anxiety. of people there's accountability yeah. you know what you're supposed to do next one of the things about my job is identifying problems and then coming up with a new solution so so many times people hand me a blank piece of paper and say fix this i'm like what <laughs> you think i can do this how do i do this right but right, i know right that without structure, the first thing to do is go find somebody who's already done it, somebody who's thought about it, somebody who's written about it, and figure out how to launch from there. Someone has thought about this before. Sure, sure. Well, listen, uh, Jatrice, I appreciate, every, like I said, everything you're doing, just your career and service, you taking the time to do this. Uh, I'm sure you're a very busy woman there in DC, but thank you so much for, for, for taking the time. We're going to make sure that there's links to everything we spoke about to include your book. That's going to be in the show notes as well. Um, if anyone wants to volunteer, they want to donate, they want to get involved. Uh, how do they go about doing that? Come to our website at www.voa.org. That's V as in Victor, OA.org. Very easy website. Go there. And you can donate, especially now at the end of the year. This is going to be a cold winter. People need support and help. And believe me, we invest your contributions well into the lives, into the future, into the well-being of veterans, seniors, children, and people who are hurting and people who are not healthy. So please remember, Volunteers of America, VOA. Dot org. And JT, I have to say thank you. I'm so glad I met you. You are so inspiring. The energy, the youth, the willingness to question and talk to people like me. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you.